Champagne 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Wisconsin Night coverage of the elections continues at the Milwaukee Public Library. Democratic Representative Josh Zebnick of Milwaukee is seeking re-election in the 9th Assembly District. Josh, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks, Steve. It's good to be back. Now, you've, you've had an interesting year. So how, how, how is Josh Zebnick doing, given all these distractions of the last few months? Uh -huh. Josh Zebnick's doing great. Um, I feel uh, stronger and, and healthier uh, and in a better place than ever before. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I've, uh, for whatever bumps in the road and things that have uh, come up, uh, you know, I've done what I've always said I would do, which is to be honest and upfront, straightforward with everybody. And, uh, you know, take responsibility for things, and including mistakes. You know, I've never pledged to be a perfect person. I don't know one that is, especially in political life. Um, but I do think it's uh, uh, what what is important is you know um, making sure you take responsibility for your actions and uh, trying to you know make things better going forward, which is exactly what I've been doing. I've been out there hitting my district hard um, and, uh, you know, talking to people at the door to door. And uh, we've had, we had a very, we've had a very positive experience, a lot of good feedback. Um, a lot what are of, they telling you is a top issue, Josh? A lot of people saying we're doing a good job. Um, I'd say, well, I mean, uh, certainly there's a lot of, if there's distraction, it's probably uh, been taken over by the national uh, issues and the chaos in Washington and with the presidential uh, situation, if you want to call it that. Uh, I mean, just people uh, very frustrated with the, the uh, erratic uh, nature of things uh, coming out of the White House and uh, sort of a lack of progress on a number of different fronts. Um, but as far as back home locally, I mean, um, you know, safe neighborhoods, public safety issues, um, which I think uh, are clearly tied to the uh, uh, opiate uh, and drug addiction problems, the underground kind of cash economy, which allows all these things to thrive in sort of the shadows and sometimes take over otherwise good neighborhoods. And it all gets tied into uh, illegal gun uh, possession and, and violent use of, of that. Uh, we just had a shooting, fatal shooting, block away from where I live. Uh, well, in how my should we, on that note, how should we change gun laws? So common sense, basic things are not going to be a cure-all, but they are a step in the right direction. So, you know, 48-hour waiting periods, background checks, cracking down on the illegal trafficking or what's called straw purchasing, where somebody who has a permit and is legally able to own a gun, uh, then you know transfers it to somebody else. When you see the guns, if you talk to Milwaukee Police Department officials or the mayor, the guns that are used in, in uh, cr criminal situations have turned over five, 10, 15 times by the time it actually uh, causes uh, injury or death. So what we know from that is there's a huge underground market that runs on cash and that runs on staying you know, under the radar of uh, law enforcement. And it's clearly tied to the drug trade, uh, human trafficking and prostitution, um, you know, people who are stuck with on the other end with alcohol and drug addiction problems who are the customers. Mm -hmm. And it's just this never ending cycle until you interrupt it. And uh, so some of these, these things can be done on uh, gun regulation. And I think you can do it in a way that doesn't infringe on anybody's right under the constitution uh, to be able to go and get certified and uh, you know legally own 
uh, a firearm. Part of this debate is whether it's time to legalize recreational marijuana, medical marijuana. Your position? Yeah, I believe in that fully. Um, I, it's not my cup of tea. Um, I'm actually a recovering alcoholic. I don't drink anymore. Um, alcohol is clearly legal and it causes a lot of damage. I've lived through that myself and seen what it uh, does. Uh, it, it almost completely ruined my life along with others who you know, know me and care about me. You can buy it every other block uh, in parts of the city of Milwaukee, let alone the rest of Wisconsin, you know. And um, so I think the, the keeping pot illegal has run its course. And uh, I also think that in terms of, you know, now that I'm in recovery, I, I know people who are suffering with uh, their addiction to opiates. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that says that we might be able to do a better job of getting people off of pill, painkiller pills, off of heroin, if they had access to legalized uh, marijuana, whether it's through medical marijuana or through just, you know, full-blown legalization. You look at the examples in the state of Colorado, and they're bringing in an enormous amount of revenue to the public sector, which they can then use for things like public safety and public health and other stuff for the common good. And I, I'd like to think, you know, with legalizing, you can reduce some of the criminal element. Part you know? of this debate is whether we need a new state prison. Do we? Uh, I'm, I don't support that. Um, I think we over-incarcerate already. Um, I think there's an imbalance between uh, how people get sentenced for crimes. I think it's gone way overboard. And in fact, in Milwaukee and in different zip codes, what you're seeing, in my view, what you're seeing happening uh, is the result of that sort of get tough on crime, heavy prison uh, sentencing of the uh, 80s and, and 90s. Folks coming out of that correction system and returning to the same neighborhoods, zip codes, having uh, as much, if not more, difficulty blend in, blending back in what we call re-entry mm -hmm. um, and being extremely limited in their options to be self-sufficient economically and have uh, some basic freedoms. If you're a felon, it's, it screws you over on any number of things, including voting. Uh, but, it, but it prevents you from being able to participate more fully in society. At some point, you've got to say, look, uh, people are going to get punished. They're going to pay their debt to society, um, but not, we don't need the overkill on a lot of these things, especially when they're not of a violent uh, nature. Okay, I'm not talking about homicides and right. rape and things like that. Understood. Clearly, crime and public safety is a big issue. Um, I guess back to your original question, though, you know, the other things are run-of-the-mill run economic issues. You know, the cost of health care, the amount of money that gets returned to the city of Milwaukee from the state, uh, which my office has worked closely with the city of Milwaukee on. Those dollars that are generated here in the Milwaukee area are being diverted to other places and other programs, in including in the transportation fund. People want to see their potholes fixed. Transportation. How do we pay for the state's highway and bridge future? Well, um, I mean, I would favor raising revenues. Gas I've, tax? I've, I've gas been, tax? The gas tax is a problem because over the long haul, it doesn't generate much revenue because cars are more fuel efficient. Um, and in some cases, people have decided to drive less, depending on what area of the state you're talking about. Um, so you got to think outside the box, in my view. Tolling? You've heard the uh, buzz in the capital? There's ways in which tolling might work. Um, I'm uh, more interested in, as opposed to putting them on the borders of the state, looking into ways in which in urban areas they can be used, like in the Twin Cities, where they have uh, express lanes that uh, during peak times of congestion, mm -hmm. uh, if you're willing to pay you know, an extra dollar, you can use those lanes, and it's all done through electronic. So what it does is it pays for the additional capacity on the highway system in a metropolitan area. Probably could have, should have done that with the zoo interchange. You would have had it done faster, and it would pay for itself because the people using that don't just live in Milwaukee County. You know, 75 85% of the people and trucks and et cetera are going throughout Wisconsin, if not throughout the upper Midwest. Uh, raising the sales tax is a possible option as well. Um, you could do that across the board and then dedicate a portion of that mm -hmm. to transportation, maybe a portion of it to things like shared revenue or their earned income tax credit so that there's some relief for middle income people. 
Um, but I do think it's clear that people in Milwaukee have had enough of what has turned into a very partisan, almost personal fighting match between Walker and Barrett, where our dollars that are generated from sales taxes, income taxes, registration fees, gas taxes, is not being put into the kinds of programs, and particularly local infrastructure, public transit, uh, which um, people depend on every day, and uh, you know it's right in your face. Let's talk about schools. MPS four-year graduation rate, sixty percent. How could that be improved? Well, um, unfortunately, you know we we keep slipping from generation to generation, where we've had uh, some long-term problems. Um, we need to beef up the money, the time, the energy. Uh, the community-wide resources spent on early childhood education. Every piece of research shows that from birth to fifth year of life is when major, major developmental stuff is happening with a kid. Brain development and communication and motor skills, frontal lobal stuff, which often when you get older plays out in a mental health or behavioral health kind of, of uh, situation. And so if you don't intervene, if you don't do that, and I don't mean just targeting it by demographic or where there's a statistic that shows, you know, this group of people is, is you know, worse off than others. I think everybody, it should be universalized, pre-4K, um, do as much for early identification of people with disabilities or things that if you catch them early enough, you can get the right services uh, in there. Um, you know, beyond that, I would say uh, that, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, higher upgrades, um, I, I think that what we need to do is uh, continue to be innovative about the, the options that are available um, to students and to parents. And Does that um, options include vouchers, choice program? Well, in my district, um, there's a good number of people that are using the voucher program, the choice program. Uh, particularly in the Latino community, particularly with the Catholic schools. Should it stick around? Um, I don't think you're going to uh, shut it down overnight, okay. and I think it's here to stay in Milwaukee. I personally don't ex support expanding it uh, statewide, and I don't support lifting the uh, income uh, thresholds where people who have the ability to already pay for school are now getting uh, subsidized. We have great public schools in my district. We have good, great charter schools in my district. South side of Milwaukee, my district is very, very blessed with a lot of um, engaged people, whether it's teachers or parents or students. Um, the one thing I would like us to start paying a better attention to is that age bracket when it's around 16, 17 years old. Uh, along with this early childhood stuff, uh, some people need to be just em put on a track to get into a tech skilled trade program and or have the ability to start working, uh, you know, maybe gradually starting at part-time, half-time, and maybe full-time along with their studies because they need to understand what the world of work is about and not just sort of leave it up to chance that when you turn 18, you graduate, now you're supposed to get into the employment world and, the, and take care of yourself. And, uh, and then what happens is people are lost. Um, local governments have been dealing, have been living with levy limits since 2006. Is it time to loosen those levy limits or get rid of them? Well, I'll tell you what, um, I, I, would pref uh, I would vote to loosen them. And I would also say that if you're not going to do that, then you got to find a way to give options to these local units of government to raise revenue for needed and uh, pub public services and things that citizens and taxpayers are saying they want and need. So whether that's, like I said, road improvements, you know, just basic pothole stuff all throughout my district in Milwaukee huge problem. It, it ruins your car. It doesn't make driving feel safe or comfortable. Uh, you know, our schools need fixing uh, from an infrastructure standpoint. Uh, people, our public transit system needs an infusion of money, our parks. So, you know, tying, uh, tying the hands of local government, uh, you know, I think 
has is has backfired in in a lot of ways um, and uh, ultimately you have to make choices in government that's what budgets are about yeah. and you know um, I think for too long uh, people have tried to you know sort of shift from you know spending money on one thing and cutting on another thing as a way to uh, maybe avoid some of those tough choices okay. and eventually that just gets kind of kicked into the future you, you say when you, when you meet with your constituents they're they're concerned about health care health care two questions does state government have a role in retaining and recruiting doctors physicians and other health care professionals I think it does have a job and especially when we pump an enormous amount of money into the educational facilities that train these medical professionals and at a federal level we spend an, a good amount of money on the, the other backdrop research and laboratory and experimental stuff and so you know we've got a lot of public investment there I think especially in an urbanized area um, and there's a lot of healthcare disparities and constraints on people's incomes um, and high poverty, I think we need to explore you know, more public involvement, whether that means, that, that could even mean direct hiring and employment okay. of people who are primary care doctors, who are nurse practitioners, and who are you know, social workers and mental health counselors and get them into different places, public schools, get them into community health centers, uh, get them into uh, the most accessible places so people can have those services. Would that also be true in the rural areas where you sure. have an older demographic? Yeah, yeah. It would be. absolutely. You know, there the challenge is distance. You know, there's X number of miles between one thing and another. You know, now in some ways, internet technology is helping to bridge some of those gaps. And, and clearly we have a pretty modern interstate infrastructure, so that is, that is helpful. Um, but you have a lot of pockets of poverty and, and people who um, you know, may choose to live elsewhere or to practice medicine elsewhere uh, because of where they can get a, a paycheck or, or other kinds of considerations. And so, um, you know, that's the kind of st I mean that's really the kind of stuff that things like UW Extension were created for sure. you know is to is to get in there roll up your sleeves and figure out a solution so that you don't have these big gaps between one part of the state and another last question do you want to highlight differences between you and your opponent in the primary August 14th well um, you know I have the same uh, uh, person running against me as last time so you know and we've we've definitely learned from that experience and uh, you know, started preparing for that right away after the last election. That's, you know, uh, uh, something, a smart strategy I've always believed in. Um, you know, I, I think that um, on an, any number of issues, my track record in the legislature and my public uh, outreach and, and, and in community involvement in, is just far deeper and wider and, and more in depth uh, in terms of uh, offering the experience and uh, the integrity and dedication. Um, you know, it's one thing to say you believe in something or it's one thing to say this is what you're gonna do. And I've actually proven that I, I can get these things done, sometimes even in, in the minority party, uh, which doesn't make things easier. Uh, I've got a far deeper roots in the neighborhood and the community in the district. Um, you know, my opponent moved in purposely to run for office right around 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. And, um, you know, I make very clear that I view public service as a uh, privilege and something that is um, really a, a, a gift to be able to, you know, be, go give back to the communities that where I ra was raised and to you know, put my sort of skills and talents to help others um, who helped me in, in past years. And so, um, you know, I, that's why I'm running for re-election again. I continue to enjoy it, and I continue to get good feedback from people who are my bosses and back in the district. Thank you, Democratic Representative Josh Zebnick of Milwaukee is seeking re-election in the 9th Assembly District. The primary is August 14th. Josh, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye.
good to be here. Thanks for your time, too. Thanks.